Welcome to the short webinar discussing the making of wills during the coronavirus pandemic and forming part of the St John's Commercial and Chancery webinar series. The pandemic has brought the making of wills into sharp focus in two respects. Not only do the requirements of social distancing create difficulties in the taking of instructions for and the execution of wills, but due to us being directly confronted with our own mortality en masse, there has been a significant rise in the number of will or codicil drafting instructions. Unfortunately, this combination is one with great litigation potential. With this in mind, I intend to consider, firstly, how social distancing requirements have complicated the making of a will. Secondly, how the complications regarding execution might be eased by reform of the current law. And finally, the current position, including how the complications might be addressed pending any intervention by the government. The first complication is in respect of the taking of instructions, as it is of course harder to assess testamentary capacity and whether the testator might be subject to undue influence without the benefit of meeting them in person. It's also harder to follow the golden rule, as assessments by doctors will also in many cases need to be conducted remotely and will likely be more difficult to arrange when the NHS is already under such unprecedented pressure. However, of use in this context is the guidance given in the High Court case of Sharp and Adam from 2005, in which it was suggested that where it is not possible in the circumstances to be entirely satisfied as to the testator's capacity, the duty of the solicitor is to warn the testator that their will might be challenged, but that if the testator nonetheless instructs the solicitor to proceed, their instructions must be implemented without delay. Therefore, provided any instructions are given following a warning of the risks, it's possible to proceed with the drafting of a will even where it's not possible to, complete, to be completely satisfied as to testator's capacity. Although, of course, that does not alter that a will should not be made where the testator is actually thought to lack capacity or to be subject to undue influence. In addition, if instructions are taken by video link, it would be helpful to record, with the client's permission, that conversation. The second and more significant difficulty arises in respect to compliance with the required formalities of making a will, and it's on this I therefore intend to focus. Of course, pursuant to Section 9 of the Wills Act 1837, the execution of a valid will requires, in particular, for it to be signed by the testator or by some other person in his presence and by his direction, and for the signature to be made or acknowledged by the testator in the presence of two or more witnesses present at the same time and that each witness either attests and signs the will or acknowledges his signature in the presence of the, of the testator. In the context of most being isolated from all but the other members of their household, the requirements in respect to the presence of the testator and the witnesses are then made all the more difficult to comply with by Section 15 of the Wills Act 1837, which provides that gifts to attesting witnesses and their spouses or civil partners are void, and which will force most to look outside of their own households for witnesses. Where presence, in the ordinary sense of the word, carries with it risk, there has been considerable discussion of the potential limits of its meaning, and there is much authority on what presence means in the context of Section 9. The focus of the authorities is on there being actual visual presence, and mental as well as physical presence, so that the last will in Brown and Skiro was invalid, where the witnesses were each in the same room of the same shop at the time of the signing, but one of the witnesses had been serving a customer when the testator and the other witness had signed the will and had no opportunity of seeing the signing or of knowing what was happening. However, there is no authority which directly addresses what presence means in the context of the technology available today. The absence of any such authority is underlined by the attention received over the past few weeks by the more than 200-year-old case of Casson and Dale, which itself refers back to the 17th century case of Shires and Glascock. In each of these cases, it was held that it was sufficient that the testator could have seen the signing of the will by the witnesses had they chosen to look. In the case of Shires and Glascock, the opportunity of seeing the signing by the witnesses was through a broken window between the room in which the testator was and the room in which the witnesses were. And in Casson and Dade, it was, famously, through the window of her attorney's office from her carriage on the street outside. By indicating that mutual presence can be achieved even where there is a supervening structure between the parties, provided that there is nonetheless visual contact between them, raises the question whether presence via video conferencing is sufficient for the valid execution of a will. The Law Commission in its 2017 consultation paper, Making a Will, suggests not, and refers to presence involving physical presence. Even if the references to physical presence are simply because it was unimaginable at the time of the cases that visual contact could be achieved by any other means than physical presence, it remains that any case brought on the ground that a will was validly witnessed by video conferencing would be unprecedented, and it must be that any will executed in that way would at least be more vulnerable to challenge. Who knows what be might be happening just out of shot? A further potential difficulty with wills executed with the assistance of modern technology is the forensic value attributed to handwritten signatures. 
For example, in Lim and Thompson, a photocopy of the testator's signature did not meet the requirements of Section 9. Therefore, for a will to be validly executed by way of modern technology, such as by witnessing via video conferencing, it is likely that there would need to be intervention by the government to permit the same. For example, in Jersey, amendments have been made to legislation to permit, initially until the 30th of September this year, the witnessing of wills by video link, as long as, in the place of witnesses signing the will, a written declaration is provided as soon as reasonably practicable confirming that the witness has witnessed the signature of the will in question over audiovisual link, has positively identified the testator and how they have done so, has seen the testator sign the will, is satisfied that the document signed by the testator is the will, and if the will is of a movable property, has heard the will read aloud in its entirety. While permitting the remote witnessing of wills comes with risk, it might be that the risk is not materially greater than when witnessing from the other side of a window or open door. Even in those circumstances, the witness's knowledge of the testator's circumstances is restricted. And unlike witnessing from the other side of a window or an open door, there is significant benefit in enabling the execution of wills while all those involved remain in their own homes without requiring travel. Another possibility which has been mooted, which would require governmental intervention to implement, is the extension of the application of privileged wills under Section 11 of the Wills Act 1837. However, such possibility perhaps raises more questions than it answers. For example, who would be able to make privileged wills, or in what circumstances would an individual be able to make one? The removal of all formalities would also, of course, simultaneously remove the protections those formalities offer including, or perhaps even particularly, from the most vulnerable. The risk posed by and the potential complexity of such an alteration perhaps makes this the least attractive option. Removing the need for witnesses, or reducing their number, or allowing beneficiaries and or their spouses to witness, seem to me to be similarly unattractive options, in that they also move too far away from protecting the vulnerable in favour of convenience. Instead, a dispensing power permitting the court in certain circumstances to uphold a will where the necessary formalities have not been complied with, might be the most attractive option, particularly where any amendments to the current law would need to be introduced quickly if they are to be of assistance during the pandemic. The power could be exercisable either on the basis that there has been substantial compliance, such that the purpose of the formalities has been fulfilled, or, more likely, regardless of the extent of non-compliance, that the court is nonetheless satisfied that the will represents the testator's intention. While this option both provides protection to testators by way of judicial oversight and flexibility, with such flexibility comes greater risk of litigation, such that the introduction of a dispensing power might be said to kick the can down the road. However, where the circumstances require swift action, noting that we were already six weeks into lockdown, providing flexibility while allowing further reflection in due course might be the best that can, be currently, that can currently be achieved. However, it is currently unclear what, if anything, the government intends to do in respect of the execution of wills during the pandemic or when it might take any such action. On the 21st of April, when answering a question asked of the Secretary of State for Justice, it was indicated that the government is currently reviewing the case for reform of the law on making wills given current circumstances. But, besides appearing to reject any alterations to the need for two independent witnesses, or any extension of the application of privilege wills, it simply stated that other reform measures are being considered at present, and subsequent references, including to witnessing documents by video conferencing generally, were in the context of the longer term and the future. We will endeavour to provide it an update if any announcements are made addressing the issue, but in the meantime, it seems that one option for executing a will during lockdown would be, where necessary, for the testator to remain inside with the witnesses on the other side of a window or an open door, as per Casson and Dade. In addition, each party should have their own pen, and ideally the will itself should be handled with the use of disposable gloves. Alternatively, it is permissible for another to sign on behalf of the testator at the their direction, and that person may also be an attesting witness. While little more than a smile and a nod was sufficient direction on the part of the testator in re Ashkettle, to protect the will from challenge, written instructions from the testator should be sought where possible. An attesting witness signing on behalf of the testator would further reduce con the contact necessitated by the making of a will, but it does also introduce a further layer of complication, and with it a further potential basis for challenge. In either case, the process of executing the will should, of course, be documented to the fullest possible extent, ideally including a photograph of the test data. Unfortunately, the uncertainty of the current situation might serve only to underline that hindsight is a wonderful thing. The Law Commission's Making a Will project was put on hold once it reached the policy development stage to enable it to focus on the reform of the law of weddings, at a time when it could not be foreseen that in the not-too-distant future, weddings would be being postponed en masse 
while the demand for wills would be incredibly high and circumstances would threaten people's ability to make them. We can but hope that the issue is addressed shortly, albeit without the benefit of a report from the Law Commission.